And I would like to introduce Cindy Campbell-Stone. And Cindy is, uh, works in the public libraries in Halifax. She's also a storyteller, and she's really involved in a couple of different storyteller organizations, the Storytellers Circle of Halifax and Storytellers of Canada. In fact, she's the past president. And today she's going to be talking about representing oral stories and folk songs, challenges in the Catherine Gallagher Project. <coughs> Cindy, great. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm glad you're... You're, you're here uh, to hear this. If you have any questions um, at the very end, please, uh, please take notes and ask. Uh, my presentation is The Lady in the Lighthouse, the Catherine Gallagher story. And Catherine Gallagher, or Mrs. Edward Gallagher, was one of Dr. Helen Creighton's main informants. Now, does everybody here know who Dr. Helen Creighton is? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You sure you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, Dr. Helen uh, Creighton um, certainly uh, collected a lot of material in her lifetime, over 60,000 different variants of songs and stories from the folk tradition collected in the Maritimes, um, mostly in Nova Scotia, starting in 1928. So the Creighton collection can be found in the Nova Scotia archives, but also in other places such as the Library of Congress and in the National Museum of Canada, which is now the Canadian Museum of History, I believe. Um, now, Catherine Gallagher was one of the main informants of Helen Creighton. Helen collected over 40 songs from Catherine. I'm still looking for songs, um, so I think there are more out there, but I'm still researching that on, on Catherine. And for much of her life, Catherine lived in a lighthouse at Shibakdo Hit. Now, I don't know what happened to this, so let's go back. Oh, oh sorry, just saw this line up in the top corner from the beginning there. Click somehow. There we go. So there's a lighthouse right there, Shibakdo Head. Uh, that's from about the 1970s. There was four different lighthouses. Um, over time, and, but that is just one of the, and look how bleak and desolate and cold it is out there. So it was a pretty, um, pretty uh, different place to live <coughs> for a farm girl who grew up in Enfield, Nova Scotia, which is inland in Nova Scotia. Now, this is a, uh, oh, Catherine died in 1957, but when I first met Catherine, actually was her, her voice on this CD, Songs of the Sea. Uh, uh, that's put out by the Helen Creighton Folklore Society. And I heard her sing the Broken Ring song and I just fell in love with her voice. And from that day on, I started learning some of Catherine's songs and I started researching Catherine. Uh, Catherine was born, Catherine Scott, on October 2nd, 1887. She was a young woman, and, uh, uh, at the age of 16, she got a teaching degree, but they wouldn't let her teach because they said she was too young. So she went back to school and she took a degree in, um, or courses in physical education and home economics. And then she eventually got a school in, a couple of schools in Nova Scotia along the eastern shore and then in Ketch Harbor, which is just down from where Shibakdo Lighthouse is. And that's where she met her husband-to-be. Edward Gallagher was a fisherman, but he also served in World War I. Veterans could apply for jobs in lighthouses, so he applied for a job at the Shibakto Head Lighthouse. Got the job in 19, in, in 1928 was when they were about to move in. They were about to be married. But something happened. Now, I'm just going to sing you a snippet of a song that Catherine's mother taught her. It's about a young girl who's going to get married. And she's very excited about this idea that she's about to get married. Catherine wasn't a young girl at the time. She was almost close to 40 years old before she, she got married. And the reason why the wedding was delayed was partly because Ed was in the First World War and she had to wait for him to get out. She used to knit him socks and send it overseas, uh, but she had to wait for him to get out and get his life together before they could get married. So this is a, a little snippet of a song. Early one morning, one morning in spring, to hear the birds whistle and nightingales sing, I spied a fair damsel who sweetly did sing, I'm going to be married on Monday morning. How old are you, my pretty fair maid, here in this valley, this valley so green? How old are you, my pretty fair maid? I'll be sixteen years old on Monday morning. 
Monday morning, Monday morning, I'm going to be married on Monday morning. Monday morning, Monday morning, I'm going to be married on Monday morning. Now, there's more to the song. <laughs> But Catherine's uh, version of this song was one of the only ones that, that was collected that actually had a chorus in it that repeated itself. Um, so it was kind of an unusual find for Helen as well. Now, um, Catherine Gallagher almost got married, but didn't, not just because of the First World War, but because her family farm in Enfield burned to the ground with her, her trousseau in it. And she was determined not to get married until she redid her trousseau. So she told Edward, you'll have to wait till I get it redone. She, she and a cousin took a boat to Boston, where her two sisters were living, and they ended up redoing her whole trousseau in record time. <laughs> and Catherine was married on a Monday morning in, a, in the St. Mary's, Mary's Basilica in Halifax. It's a very small wedding. I guess they didn't want to wait any longer, just wanted to get her done. <laughs> so shortly after they moved in, Catherine um, actually had a family. She had three boys, one right after the other. She was almost 40 years old at this time. And actually, when Ed went, went, was called to the war, he was over 30. So uh, he never actually made it to the front lines. And Cousin Kenny is just there on the left. But those are the three boys, uh, Don, Max, and Edward. So, and that was the house that they lived in, at the, their first house that they lived in, in the lighthouse. Now imagine what it must have been like raising three young sons next to a cliff in a lighthouse on a piece of remote land jutting out into the mouth of Halifax Harbor. Couldn't have been easy. Now this next slide shows the Shibakto Head Lighthouse, the, the second house that they lived in which had the lighthouse actually in the, in the top of the house. So, and down below you'll see uh, the Foghorn building, and Ed uh, quite often um, had to go down that cliff to run the Foghorn, and uh, he, he, loved, he loved scaring people with the Foghorn. He would invite them into the building and show them all the equipment and everything, and of course it would be muffled in there with all the engines and or everything going, and then he would have it timed it, it, exactly to take them outside, and he'd say, come and enjoy the view and then the foghorn would go off while they were standing beside it and nearly scare the life out of them. So that was one of the things, little tricks he loved to play. Um, but in 1937, Catherine's life changed when she met two song ladies who drove up to the lighthouse in a car. Helen Creighton and Doreen Sr. met Catherine in August of 1937 on a Saturday. In Helen's book, uh, Songs and Ballads from Nova Scotia, it had just been published and Helen showed Catherine a copy. And she asked Catherine if she knew any of the songs in it. And Catherine looked through it, and she started humming a few of the tunes. And she said, yeah, she knew songs like this. She knew a song called the Broken Ring Song. Would you like to hear it? And Helen said, oh, yes, certainly. Well, said Catherine, though, I got to scrub my floor first, because company's coming the, the next day. So Catherine Gallagher sang the Broken Ring Song for Helen while scrubbing her floor. And uh, I'm going to sing that, I'll sing that song for you now. Uh, well, I, maybe I'll give it a little bit of an intro. For those of you who don't uh, know the Broken Ring song, uh, it's a broadside. And according, it also, according to uh, traditional songs of Nova Scotia, it's also known as seven long years. And seven is the usual time of parting in English, Scandinavian, and European songs and stories. This is an old and widespread motif in folk ballad and epic, including the Odyssey, such as a lover returns in disguise and tests the fidelity of his sweetheart and produces the other half of the ring. So the woman would have one half, the, other would have, uh, the man would have the other half. So it's a, a Celtic ring, too, it's called. And there are other versions as well, uh, Seven Long Years, as I said, The Sailor's Return, and two other versions called The Broken Ring. But the thing to remember in, in this song is there's a woman left on shore while her lover has gone to sea. Now, sometimes you go to sea for a very long time. It could be three, six years if you're a whaling ship or whatever. <coughs> you could get lost at sea. Your ship could be abandoned in a foreign land. It could take a while for word to get back. 
Your looks could change, especially if you were a younger man in your teens. So between the wind, the salt, the sea, the weathered skin, uh, your, your hands might be brown and curled from the weather and they're pulling the ropes. And you could look, start off looking very young, but by the time you came back, you could look quite old, have more facial hair, etc. So you'd almost look like a stranger, perhaps. So keep this in mind as I sing this song. As a sailor walked all in a garden, a fair young maiden he chanced to spy. It was for to view her, he stepped up to her and said, young lady, can you fancy I? Oh, fancy you, a man of honor, a maid of honor I'll never be, for I am waiting for a sailor whose home is far across the sea. It's seven years since my love has left me, and seven years since I did him see. Another seven, I'll wait upon him. Perhaps he'll come back and marry me. What if your lover, well, he is married, and is enjoying wedded bliss. What if your lovey is dead and buried? The cruel ocean lies o'er his breast. Well, if he's married, I hope he's happy. And if he's dead, well, I wish him rest. But it is for his sake I'll never marry. The reason why is I love him best. What if I be your single sailor, the one you don't expect me to be? What if I be your single lover, who has come back for to marry thee? Well, if you be my single sailor, the one I don't expect you to be, Show me the ring that was broke between us, and when I see it, I will believe. He put his hands all in his bosom, his fingers being both brown and small. He pulled out the token between them broken, and when she saw it, she downed it full. He picked her up all in his arms and said, Fair lady, I'm none the worse, for I have plenty of gold and silver. The cruel ocean I'll ne'er more cross. <laughs> so, <clears throat> according to um, Helen Creighton, Catherine often sang while she worked, like a fisherman or a sailor or a lumberman sang, to help keep a rhythm to make the work go quicker or easier. So Catherine, she was, she was always singing while she, while she was working. She sang songs she learned from her mother and her father, ballads and broadsides, songs about the sea, songs of the folk, just what Helen was looking for. Now, in 1938 and 1939, Catherine was employed extensively on the CBC radio broadcasts. Now, you can see right in here that she's certainly, she's doing her ironing while she's doing her working songs. Um, so it looks like she's having a good time, doesn't it? Yeah. There's also another picture of her and Helen uh, recording outside the lighthouse. And it looks a little windy there, doesn't it? <laughs> as well. That must have been challenging, trying to make an audio recording in that wind as well. Oh, okay. In 1939, the first convoy ships left for England from Halifax Harbor. Catherine watched many ships sailing from the harbor during the war, and later after the war, Catherine would remember a song from another war that affected Halifax Harbor in 1812. This song was the Chesapeake and the Shannon, a song about a conflict of the War of 1812 between the US and Britain. 
The Shannon sailed from Halifax Harbor to Boston Harbor, determined to call the Chesapeake to battle. There was a battle, very short, about 12 minutes, and the Shannon captured the Chesapeake and brought her into Halifax Harbor. And that is a, is a, is a painting of that uh, victory. <laughs> now, Catherine's version of the song, uh, The Chesapeake and the Shannon, she has some mistakes and there are a couple of missing verses, but it took her two years to remember the verses that she did. But see, Catherine knew that Helen was looking for these types of songs. And as far as, I, as far as I know, this song of Catherine's is the only song about the Chesapeake and the Shannon that's sung from the British view collected in the Maritimes. I thought I'd sing just, just a, a snippet of it. It goes something like this. "'Twas on the glorious first of June, at ten o'clock in the forenoon, that we sailed out of Boston Bay, that we sailed out of Boston Bay, for to fight the Chesapeake boys. Now, the full version of that song um, can be found on the Sea Song CD. So if you want to hear the whole thing, it is, it is on there, including some words and comments from Helen. So Catherine was an important informant because she sang songs that were historically significant with a wide range of topics. From love songs, from a girl wanting to get married, from two lovers finding each other after a long uh, split while he was at sea. A lot of her songs, too, were about uh, women or about women's experiences or point of view. So Catherine did sing, as I mentioned, a lot of songs in the CBC radio, uh, but the Second World War had come along. The war changed Catherine and Ed's life. In November 1939, lighthouse keepers became part of the coastal defense system. So the point of land at Shabucto Head was an <laughs> ideal place to monitor traffic at the mouth of Halifax Harbor, an important part of defense strategies. The lighthouse was torn down to make room for a gun battery and a searchlight station, and later a radar station. A new lighthouse was built on the next point of land, just north of the old one and the new lighthouse had the light on top of the house rather than a freestanding tower. So here was Catherine with three, you know, just recently married, and uh, here she had to move house as well. Now Ed's role was as a, the official observer. He had to log sightings of aircraft, subs, strange lights or signals and people. So that's his, his pose <laughs> as he's pretending to watch there. This aspect of Catherine's life I have to further explore. Um, living next to a, a army barracks was very interesting. I'm starting to get more information on it, and I, I have to further explore this, this uh, section of Catherine and Ed's life. This is a photo of Catherine, uh, the CBC recordings on top of the Nova Scotia Hotel on the roof. Now. Um, after the war, Catherine sang a lot more on the radio, but she was paid $10 per session because Helen insisted that the tradition bearers be paid the same as the professionals. So they were singing on the radio, the tradition bearers were singing next to the professionals. Here, here you'll see um, Helen is right in the middle, right there, front and center in the middle, and just off to the right, almost out of the slide uh, in the front there, is, that's Catherine. There's a better photo of her here in the three traditional singers, Walter Roast and uh, Catherine and then Edmund Henneberry, who was filling in for Ben Henneberry, who was sick at the time and, and elderly. Now Catherine and other tradition bears became local celebrities. They had visits from folklorists and people interested in folk music and Helen would bring people to hear Catherine sing out to the lighthouse, people such as Ed McCurdy. This is another photo of uh, Catherine and Helen having fun. Don't they look like they're having a good time? This was actually a, um, a bit of a pose photo. Uh, they're kind of dressed up. It's a bit staged. They're kind of a little too dressed up. They've got jewelry on and really, really nice uh, dresses and outfits. And, and uh, they normally, normally probably wouldn't have worn that. Although Catherine at the time had no teeth because they, she hadn't gotten them yet. She had to get new teeth, false teeth. So uh, that's just a picture of her without singing without her teeth in. 
Um, Catherine and Helen had a lifelong friendship. There were many letters, they exchanged many letters, and they moved beyond just, um, you know, Catherine moved beyond just being Helen's informant. Uh, they actually became friends later in life, too. And uh, Catherine died in 1957, and Helen was quite devastated because she was away at the time. Helen also recorded the Gallagher family, who were very musical as well. Edward uh, Gallagher was a great storyteller too, and I have yet to explore some of the stories that are that are on the tapes at the at the Nova Scotia archives. Um, and it uh, th they were very very uh, interesting family. Uh, so let's see what my time is. Yeah. Well, I've given you a taste of the story of Catherine and just a, a taste of her life and a taste of the, her songs. There's so much more. Challenges with, this co with uh, the Helen Creighton collection are for many reasons. It, it is a vast collection. And you have to keep in mind, uh, according to Clary Croft in his biography of Helen, uh, Canadian, Canada's first lady of folklore, Helen started her research a decade before the academic study of folklore in North America began. There were no ground rules for her to follow. She was helping to create a discipline. And when she began collecting, her initial search was for old time songs. And in those early years, she didn't even call herself a folklorist. So as a result, uh, like Helen was collecting at a time when there was such a mixture of differing expectations depending on who was asking her to do the collecting. So there's some copyright issues to consider. Uh, and especially where her collection is in different areas. And I, so the Library of Congress, you know, the National Museum, the Mount A recordings, the Nova Scotia archives, it's, um, I'm still exploring some of that to see which materials I can use, uh, which I have to get permissions for, and her published works, of course, would have, uh, have to have permissions for that. So it's a little bit of a mix in, in terms of copyright and things like that, especially if I want to use her original recordings. If I do my own versions, it's a little bit different. The, um, the other challenges are just with the scope of Catherine Gallagher's material and not just Catherine's, but her family's. Uh, Edward Gallagher, as I said, you know, he, he has a wealth of information in there too. Uh, I'm still trying to sort, th sort through things. There's, as a storyteller, I'm seeing there's so many stories here to be told. She had a fascinating life. She went through two world wars, a career, wife and mother living in a lighthouse, a local celebrity, her friendship with Helen. And as a singer, she had so, so many songs. There's so many songs to choose from that I can sing. I'm having a difficult time uh, choosing them. Uh, but I'm determined to, to learn them all eventually. And how do we use this material? Well, I've made presentations similar to this one at, pla uh, at places like the libraries and museums, the Mystic Sea Music Festival. And I've used songs of Catherine and stories of her life at other libraries, museums, and other events, such as What the Folk, which is an open mic event and outreach program of the Helen Creighton Folklore Society. So I'm slowly getting her, her name out there. And I'm currently also working on a theatrical and storytelling stage performance. Uh, but I'd also like to have some sales product to go along with it, so to promote her story. So I'm kind of compiling a biography, uh, as well as the audio recordings of her songs and my versions of her songs in CD or perhaps online. So I've got some decisions to make, some, some uh, ways to go to decide how to present Catherine and how to do it. The other thing, though, I'd like to, to really make a point of, though, is the institutions such as museums and archives and libraries, conferences such as this, can assist in getting some of this original material out to the public. And we're talking the real deal here, not stuff in books or on re audio recordings, CDs, papers, articles, whatever. I'm talking the real deal. Getting people to tell this in the oral tradition getting people to sing these songs in the oral tradition, because that's how they were collected. And I think sometimes that is getting lost a bit in all this you know, collecting. And, and we're so big on literature, we're so big on research, that sometimes we forget about the real thing, about the tradition bearers and where this all came from. So you know, one way to do that is to hire and promote a storyteller and singer to present in the oral tradition. 
<laughs> but that's another discussion. So I'd like to thank you uh, guys for listening and thank the, the conference here. And there's a lot of thanks to uh, people along the way who have helped out. Um, and I especially like Clary, Clary, for instance. He's helped out a lot, been very encouraging. And actually, Margot, you're not on there, but you've heard my story of Catherine many times. And oh, I heard you whining for years. <laughs> <laughs> so I appreciate that. And Leo has always come to all my presentations, so thank you, Leo, for that too. But I especially want to make a note to Max Gallagher, of course. He is the youngest of the sons, and he's in his 80s. And I've interviewed him, and that, again, another aspect of this. Mm -hmm. um, and he's been really great to give me a real sense of what Catherine was like and what his family was like and what it was like living in a lighthouse. Mm -hmm. I like to just end with one of Catherine's little snippet of her song. And it goes like this. Come all ye old comrades, come now let us join. Come lend your sweet voices in chorus with mine. Let's drink and be merry and above all refrain. We may now and may never all meet here again. Thank you. <laughs> I'll take some questions if anybody has any questions. Okay. I'm, I might be the only one who doesn't know this. Uh, but could you tell us more about um, Catherine's involvement in CBC? Like, she just sang songs? I, I, I she just what? She just sang songs while ironing. I didn't get this part. Oh, uh, no, well, the, the CBC, she would actually go to the studio, okay. right? And she, and she would sing. Uh, Helen would do, do all the arranging of getting the tradition bearers together. Did Helen have a show on CBC that Catherine was singing on? That's part of my, uh, maybe Clary, do you know yes. that answer? Um, this part the of my research. The Canadian Broadcasting Corporation had an agreement with the BBC, <laughs> and they were making co-productions, and Helen was uh, contracted to put together a series of folk music programs. And at that time, of course, you basically hired classically trained musicians to do arrangements of the folk songs. And I think there were four hour long broadcasts. And <clears throat> excuse me, Helen said, yes, but we need the tradition bearers there as well. And they need to be paid the same amount of money. So that's how they got involved with, with the program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yes. And I know it's difficult with CBC, but have you accessed those recordings? Have you heard those programs before? Those, no. those, those no. programs are, uh, are, are no longer extant. Yeah. Uh, CBC didn't keep those particular programs. Yeah. yeah. Which is un unfortunate, but you know. There's also a program uh, CBC did back in 1935, I think it was, of Ed Gallagher. Uh, playing music and calling songs because he used to go to the dances where he and Catherine probably met. Um, and it was actually a cross-country broadcast, a national broadcast from Lighthouses uh, that CBC did. And uh, Max Gallagher has a, um, a record of that. So it's CBC recordings of all, all the, through all the Lighthouses in Nova Scotia. That, so Ed, Ed is there. Uh, I've listened to it and just been kind of gobsmacked that it, it's there. I don't know that the CBC still has that recording. Max might be the only one that has a record of it. It has a, an original recording. Uh, but I'm, yeah, I don't and know. is there like maybe transcriptions? Because I know with Edith Folk's uh, folk programs in the 50s, I've read just transcriptions of what the programs yeah. said, uh, like Ed McCurdy singing or Alan Hill singing. And well the, well, the Helen Creighton collection is huge. Mm -hmm. um, I have, uh, I've only touched uh, a tip of it. Yeah. Um, I can spend, you can spend hours in the Nova Scotia archives searching through things. I've discovered, you know, letters. There are some transcripts of some of the shows, yes. There are some um, uh, programs, like the, that say who was there and, and uh, who presented and things like that. Uh, but I haven't, I haven't <coughs> gone through everything yet. Uh, there's also so. correspondence between uh, one of the people there you saw beside Helen on top of the roof was Robert Anderson. He was the CBC producer, 
and there's correspondence in, in Helen's diary entries that talk about how they developed the programming and how Helen insisted. And for instance, uh, uh, Walter Roast going in and, and being broadcast, and then the, the classical musicians coming up and saying, you know, we can we can actually learn something from you in, in musical phrasing and things like that. So yeah. there's tons of information there. And, and Catherine was very precise in how she sang the songs, and um, she also um, wanted to be true to the memory, which is why it took her two years to remember the Chesapeake and the Shannon song, which is why I gave it as an example, because she really she, she started to understand what Helen was looking for. She wanted to be true to that tradition. She didn't want to just go make up verses. She wanted to try and remember exactly what she heard in, in that sense, too. So. Sorry, nope, that's time. okay. I'm going to have to cut off the conversation. I always hate doing that. But thank you very much, Cynthia. Oh.